Welcome to Radio Who, What, Why. I'm Jeff Sheckman. For those of you that are old enough, you may remember that one of the crazy ideas that came out of counterinsurgency during the Vietnam War was that we often had to destroy a village in order to save it. It was counterintuitive, and maybe it was right or wrong, but it went to the heart of the broader argument that we see playing out over and over again in so many areas where in order to do better and really focus on long-term good, we have to go beyond the immediate emotional reactions and see the bigger picture. Such is the case with California's forests. Many are overgrown, populated with millions of dead trees, and the state has neither the resources nor the manpower to deal with this. More complicating is the relationship with California's largest landowner, the federal government, and the interface with private property. Today, the cost in terms of life, property, and environmental damage is staggering. My guest, Julie Cart, a longtime environmental reporter in California and a writer for Cal Matters, has written extensively about the horrors California now faces, seemingly on an annual basis. It is my pleasure to welcome Julie Cart here to Radio Who, What, Why. Julie, thanks so much for joining us. Good to be with you, Jeff. Sorry about the circumstances. Most people, when they look at the forest, see this glorious bounty of nature. And in fact, the reality is that it's kind of a disaster waiting to happen. Talk about this in the broad sense first. Well, there's a broad sense, and then there's the, the, the view of, of fire. The broad sense is that fire was a, a natural uh, part of any ecosystem. It, it, it came and went, natural fires with uh, lightning. Native Americans used to light fires to clear land and to chase out animals and things like that. Um, but we, we are afraid of fire. I guess we're cavemen at heart. So since for 200 years, 100 and a half years, um, men and women have sought to put out fires. So the, the forests are very, very full in most places. And that density, rather than being a sign of health, is, uh, from a biological standpoint, uh, really uh, difficult. It makes it difficult for trees to compete for, for, for nutrients, for sun, for water, and it also uh, compounds problems of fire. How did the situation get this bad? Well, there's two parts of it. Uh, the situation in terms of forest policy got to this point because the U.S. Forest Service, which used to do most of the firefighting, in the, uh, certainly in the American West, uh, started a policy um, in the 19th century of putting out fires as quickly as possible. And that's because of the fear that they would get out of hand and they didn't have the, the capacity to, to contain them. And also just because the fires, in the cases that they were talking about, um, were occurring so near to people. So they put out fires um, not allowing what would be considered a natural burn, and uh, it, it led to a, some overgrowth. Of course, there was quite a lot of timber cutting at that time, too. So it became a, there was a policy of when we see a fire, we jump on it and we put it out. The second part of it in California uh, is the, the drought um, and bark beetle infestation. So you have stressed trees. In especially the southern Sierra Nevada range that um, are ripe for beetles to jump on them and uh, start boring through and, and basically killing these trees. When you have that kind of tree density, these guys jump from tree to tree. That's a bit simplistic, but it, it, they don't have to travel very far. And it, again, uh, just sort of speeds up and, and makes worse a, a problem. So the two prong. There's a policy. There are environmental um, uh, situations that have caused it as well. Is, in fact, one of the problems and one of the fears as it relates to fire that we have also built closer and closer to these forests? That's, that's completely the problem, Jeff. The, the imperative to put out fires is different in places, densely populated places like California than, say, Alaska, where there are fires that, that go for, for months at a time. They're, they're monitored, they're watched, in some cases they're herded around. Uh, by fire managers, but they have a role to play, and they're not doing any harm. There's some air quality issues, but generally speaking, they let them go. In Southern California, there is um, this funny little place that 
uh, fire people call the wildland urban interface, the WUI, and it is where we all want to live. Everyone wants to be on the edge of something. The next, the next, and then another subdivision leapfrogs. You have Lake Tahoe where people are plunked down right in the middle of forests. It's it's a beautiful place to live in redwoods, etc. So the imperative then becomes we have to save people and then property. And there's no idea, there's no even opportunity in the minds of, of the, the, the fire folks to put these fires, or to, excuse me, to allow them to burn at all be, and, and do some of this work of clearing the forest because you, you just can't allow it because of the, the person, the danger, public safety. The other interface that's just as critical, it seems, is between state forest land and private property that's forested. Yeah, it makes managing a landscape extremely difficult when you have this mosaic. So just kind of big numbers, um, 30% of California is forested. It's not the only place where fires occur, but those are the the, the kind of uh, mega fires that we're talking about. So you have um, 30% of it is forested. 60% of that forested land is owned by the federal government. And California, it comes in about 2% as far as ownership. And the rest is this, uh, please don't do the math, <laughs> but the rest is a, a sort of complex, uh, p- certainly private property, county, uh, all kinds of smaller ownership. And each entity has a different approach, has different uh, tools, and it makes it very, very complicated. Now, the state and the Forest Service, the U.S. Forest Service, so state is uh, managed by Cal Fire, that's our firefighter, firefighting force, and the U.S. Forest Service have an agreement called a Good Neighbor Policy that was embedded in a in a federal bill that allows each to work on the other land. So, what makes people crazy is um, or, or uh, irritated, I, I guess is a better term. The, the Forest Service. Um, common complaint in rural California. The Forest Service isn't managing the, the its forest, its land proper, properly. I have a ranch, a farm, a vineyard adjacent to it. A fire starts on their land, and because of this overgrowth and because of this poor stewardship, that allows the fire to grow and come onto my property, then I'm stuck with it. So everybody screams and yells, and uh, as we know, that's part of living in California. And what, if anything, is being done to begin to address this? And, and, and also, why has it been so difficult to get the focus put on this? Well, it's difficult on so many levels. There are the optics of fire. Um, there is, which we, as I said, in our reptilian brain, fire is bad. Uh, and we are afraid of it, and we can't very often control it. There are the difficulties in cutting trees, both, um, again, with what it looks like when you have a healthy, what otherwise people might consider a healthy forest. It's sitting there, and then you get these crews in there, and their chainsaws are going, and and, uh, uh, sawdust is flying, and that looks bad um, and can be. Um, And there's also the the, the difficulty uh, and expense of doing that work. It's very, very expensive to go into a forest, a hillside, steep hillside, and start cutting trees, removing them, and then disposing of them. So, I mean, a home, one of the problems homeowners in California are landowners are, are experiencing is, uh, is this epidemic of dead trees, 129 million dead trees across the state. It, removing trees is very expensive. It can be $1,000 a tree. So it's not really any less, even though there's tremendous volume, uh, on the U.S. And, and state forests. So it's really expensive. And to do it by hand, which is called a mechanical treatment, where you pick small diameter trees because you want to keep the big ones, that then becomes expensive in and of itself. And then there's no commercial value for that wood. So you are removing at great expense something that you can't then turn around and sell to kind of pay for the project. It, it, it's, it's complicated on so many levels. If you want to burn, which is um, a, an efficient, again, but very fraught process, they're called controlled burns or prescribed fires. So this time of year, um, forest managers would, would have already identified places where 
they that are in need of this, usually around communities. One of the things you point out is that the dead trees in these forests aren't doing the environment any good at all. They've sort of outlived their usefulness in that regard. Well, the importance of forests are just so it's impossible to overstate the importance of forests to California. There are watershed, the Sierra Nevada, that's the focus of a, a recent report uh, in, on these topics. Um, the Sierra Nevada holds 60% of the state's watershed. So trees serve what they call ecological services or ecosystem services. They hold water in, so there are water watershed. They absorb carbon through photosynthesis, so they're taking carbon out of the air. Uh, and so they're called carbon sinks, and then they provide all the habitat and, and all the other things that, that we know that forests do. So when trees die, they release carbon because they're carbon-based entities, as we are, mm. and they lo- so they're not only losing their capacity to help us pull carbon out of the air and reduce greenhouse gases, they are emitting greenhouse gases and that is very bad and burned trees and dead trees emit something called black carbon that is on another order uh, worse in terms of emissions there are when fires occur high severity fires uh, the carbon that's released uh, is in in some cases uh, Com- comparable to, it can be a, a couple months of a fire, it can equal the number of emissions from cars in California for a year. I mean, it's quite serious. So there is a, uh, a climate change impact, both uh, positive for healthy forests and negative for ones that burn or die. What has been state policy with respect to this? And how bad is the shortage of resources to address this? You were talking earlier about how expensive this was. Cal Fire has a budget of more than $2.5 billion. The problem that California faces is because of the public safety issues of fire suppression, fighting fires, that is taking precedence over doing projects and doing things that can uh, mitigate these fires when they occur. You, no one is saying that, that there's no fireproof forest or even any place in California. Fires will, will occur. What you want to do is reduce their size and severity. So th- that's very, very expensive. But the, the, the more expensive thing is to spend money on the back end putting out the fires than it is to do the work on the front end. So what the, to answer your question, what the agencies say is, We never catch our breath. We don't ever have a down moment where we can take the crews that are the firefighters and make them the forest uh, clearers and do do that kind of work because they they feel like they never have a moment to to get ahead. So it is hugely expensive. Um, The state uh, augments CAL FIRE's budget fairly generously, understanding this is a pretty serious problem, with money from the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, more than $200 million from that, uh, which is the money that is uh, gained from the cap-and-trade program that California has, um, carbon selling of carbon credits. And that money g- goes to CAL FIRE, which then gives it to local communities, um, counties, uh, small groups to do the forest clearing that, that the agency can't necessarily do. Um, so it's, it's, it's almost an intractable problem because it is so complex and so ongoing that you, you know, they just really don't ever feel like they can get ahead of it and, and start doing the backlog, what you might consider the backlog of the work. It's also a vicious cycle in that the slower the progress is in clearing these forests, the more fires that we're clearly going to have, the more resources that go into fighting the fires, and the less resources and time for clearing. That's completely it, and I'm, I'm quite delighted that I'm not in charge of all this to try to, to sort it out. Um, so it, 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 a lot of the problem or some impediments that, that are all, often cited uh, that are in the way of doing this work, uh, one of the big ones is public perception. So I, I interviewed a, a couple of Forest Service guys in the Plumas National Forest in 
uh, up in the northern Sierra, and they said, you know, we, we it takes years and years, and it's no exaggeration, to uh, plan uh, a burn uh, with very understandable and and reasonable environmental restrictions because you have to make sure you're not uh, in a place that's particularly sensitive for endangered species or there's a public safety issue they have to get because these burns that are part of the forest clearing are um, also carbon emitters, so there, there's an air quality issue. There, they need permission. They have to understand meteorological uh, trends and things like that. Anyway, there's there's a lot that are that that makes it difficult to plan one of these, and and they can take three years uh, from the time that you identify, say, a hundred acres where you want to burn, to the, the day that you can start it. Um, anyway, these guys say that. Uh, the, the public part of it is uh, they were burning, they were planned they, in the middle of a prescribed burn above the town of Quincy uh, that they felt was quite imperiled by this hillside of overgrown uh, forest. They started to burn, and then suddenly the wind changed, and they were an hour into it that took a couple of years to plan and all these people around, and uh, phones started ringing. People said, there's smoke coming into town. There's, you know, we're, we're under fire siege, and understandably, and it got shut down. So we need, according to fire authorities, we need to, to better accept and understand exactly what this work is. You know, when we see crews out there cutting, um, it's, it's not the evil timber industry uh, clear-cutting California to, to make a profit. It is... Um, public land that we all own that is being managed um, to, to keep everybody safe and to keep the forest healthy. I mean, that's, that's another issue. It's really it, the, the healthy forest will help us all is, I think, the bottom line for them. And with respect to the private property and, and the forests on private property, what, if any, incentives is the state providing to get landowners to do clearing on their land? It's really an owner's burden financially for private pop property owners to manage their property for fire, to, to protect not just themselves, but should a fire occur, uh, to keep it off other people's land, because nobody wants that to happen. Um, the state prov- has a pretty robust grant program uh, to help with that. Um, I don't think in any regard it ever pays fully for that, but there are local groups, um, there's, there's Cal Fire and cal- counties where this is an issue uh, are, are kind of in that program and they, they can get their hands on that money or request it at any rate. It's, everyone has to do their part because we're connected. So the fire, uh, I, I realize it's simplistic, but the fire doesn't stop at a border and say, well, we better not go here. This is this, is this guy's <laughs> private ranch and we've been burning on state property or forest service property or park service property. So one person's neglect does impact another landowner's property. And that's so, so there's a requirement that everybody uh, uh, be fire safe. And that goes beyond the, the kind of norm that everybody, that a lot of people are aware of, which is keep your firewood away from your house and the clearing around your house. This is uh, a, a much larger scale uh, kind of fire, fireproofing. And um, it's, it's, a, it's quite expensive. And to what extent have environmental rules and regulations, and you mentioned permits and the like before, to what extent has that hindered sometimes private property owners from doing what they need to do on their side? Yeah, California's environmental laws are usually pretty easy to scapegoat for um, slowing down lots of projects, and, and they're there for a reason. Um, I, I think the air, the air quality issues around fire are very real. Um, there are huge health problems. It's a very, very serious problem, um, and uh, not to be taken lightly. So when you're doing a prescribed burn, these, these fires that for, are for clearing, uh, it, it, it makes perfect sense that you would have to consider what the emissions are from those fires, and not just in the terms of carbon and greenhouse gases, but just public health. 
But the argument is that they are, or, or the science would say, that though the release, the, both the emissions and the carbon from those fires that are set purposely, they're low intensity, uh, are much smaller uh, than high intensity, severe fires. But private property owners, I mean, they're, in some cases you can get permits. Florida has a really interesting model for this um, of training private property owners to how to do these fires, how to, to manage controlled burns on their own property. They're trained and then they're certified, and then they're indemnified by the state. So I have five acres and I'm doing a, a controlled burn that I have a permit for that everybody is aware is happening, kind of keeping their eye on it. And if something happens, not through negligence, uh, because you just can't control everything, uh, and it gets it destroys property or gets onto someone else's land, the state helps them out. The state, you, you don't have an incredible burden because it's understood it's, this is, uh, you know, enlightened self-interest. If you do that, it's cheaper for us, so we're going to pick up a little bit of the load. And they have a big education program, so people understand when they see burning that it's not a, necessarily an emergency. It's, it's, uh, it's actually for good, or it can be. So private property owners have... Uh, a, a recognized right in Florida to manage their their land, and the state has uh, helped them along managing it in a in a more scientific uh, uh, fire safe way. And California, some some people here think California needs to look at that, and and there's some legislation coming out that that might uh, address that. That you can't hamstring private property owners who have a big role to play by. Uh, what some people might consider onerous uh, environmental uh, blocks, but they're there for a reason. I mean, it, it, it's a bit, it, you, you can't broadly say that environmental laws in California are stopping these projects. They just simply aren't. But, and I think we would not want uh, pretty random and wanton <laughs> cutting and burning. It's, you, you do have to consider uh, the, the holistic uh, system that you're dealing with. Right, you had mentioned the optics before, and it's an issue that that private property owners have to deal with as well, with respect not just of b- controlled burns, but cutting and clearing as well. Oh yeah, I mean, you, we're we're all busybodies. You know, we we look at uh, go up to Yosemite and we see cutting and say, how dare them desecrate this beautiful national park? Um, maybe those trees are coming down because they're a public because they're dead or dying, and they're a public health and safety issue. Um, they're, it's we all peek over the hedge and and say, boy, that guy's got a really messed up backyard, and he needs to clean that out, or she's got too many trees, and there's going to be pests and all kinds of things. So, <laughs> I I think what California officials are trying to do, and and their success is, is to be judged by others, but I, I think what they look at in terms of fire and private property is the responsibility to not only keep your land fire safe and, and publicly safe, uh, but also to not allow it to your problems or your neglect to become someone else's problem. So you have to balance that with your your own right to do whatever you want with your property. I mean, there's you. We do have private property rights in the state and in the country, and so it's a tough one. It's people don't like to be told what to do. Um, what they're trying to, the needle they're trying to thread is to uh, show or coax folks into saying, look. If you do this, this is good for you. We like it too. We're not telling you; it's, we're not mandating it, but we're kind of showing you how this is this is this is actually a, a plus for you, and we're going to help you a little bit through education and a little granting. Because when these fires happen, there is a federal role, particularly with respect to FEMA, if there's significant damage. Do the feds have any role or any influence or any say in these management practices? Oh, the the, the feds have. Uh, probably the loudest voice in the room. Um, 60% of the forests in California are 
owned under the jurisdiction of the U.S. Forest Service, and, and almost half the property, period, all half the land in California is owned by the federal government, various agencies. So they have a big say. Um, they try not to speak too loudly because they're the federal government, and sometimes people get a little resentful. So there are, for example, there's a task force that is a statewide task force that's dealing with the problem or looking at the problem of forest health in terms of the trees and the dying trees. And uh, there are 80 different entities, state, local, federal. I mean, that, I don't, there's no table large enough to, to, <laughs> around which uh, they can have a conference. So the federal government has a huge role to play. Um, interestingly, in California, usually the federal government is the big deep pockets people that sit around and say, well, okay, I guess I have to pull out the checkbook. California has quite a lot of dough to put on this, and, uh, and, they, and they, we spend it because it's, it's a serious problem. It's, a, it's, it's an issue for us. So it, when you write the checks, you have a bit more say. I, I, it's, it sounds a bit crass, but it, it's – if you say we're going to take this on, we will take on this responsibility, even though it's a U.S. forest, then it gives you a lot more leverage. It gives you a, a, lo- a louder voice. You mentioned that the attitude last year after the fires was never let a crisis go to waste. When we look at what's taking place right now, have we learned anything? Did we benefit from the experience of last year's fires? Well, as my mother might say, we're a bunch of hardheads. I mean, it takes the the lessons are there. The 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 learning and implementation uh, from the lessons is another issue. So, of course, the legislature uh, spent a lot of time. In fact, um, some people say it, it it occupied so much of the air in the room that a lot of other important uh, legislative priorities uh, didn't get attended to. But when you really came out of it, it was. Um, allocating money for mitigation efforts, so forest clearing and uh, making uh, grants available to for communities to be fire safe, which also has to do with clearing brush um, and some education. Uh, they did some work, which is now very much in the news, regarding the role of utilities and their liability for fires, uh, right. which, of course, is uh, very much on the minds of Pacific Gas and Electric at the moment. But, um, in, you know, as we do in California, we tend to study things to death. We know a lot about the science of fire. We know a lot about fire behavior, um, where fire occur, fires occur, how they occur. But to actually do something about it is, um, I, I would say, we're not, uh, we're not at the forefront. With respect to the mitigation efforts, one of the things you talk about is that it's very difficult to get the resources, not just because of money or manpower, but because that money and manpower is going consistently to fighting the fires, and there really isn't time to do the mitigation. Is that an ongoing problem? Well, the big problem is the fire calendar. There used to be a time... um, in California and, and really the American West, when there was an uh, identifiable fire season where, and, and in fact, many of the firefighters are called seasonals because they're hired for only a portion of the year. So you could say um, from this month to this month, we will be uh, fighting fires, doing fire suppression, as they like to say. And then in the winter, Phew, you know, we can get down to being foresters because, you know, Cal Fire actually is our forestry department. So there's other stuff they're supposed to do. But they, they had time in the winter, uh, four or five months, where they could do this forest clearing, uh, cutting dead trees down that are quite dangerous, um, and doing all the other work to make the state more fire safe. That doesn't happen anymore because that calendar is out the window. It, we here we are in November. There's going to be fires. I'm in Los Angeles. There's going to be fires in Southern California in December and January. And you all had your fires in January last year, and at, you know at the New Year. So there's no time anymore. So the resources uh, are stretched thin. And the other thing that used to happen is. California used to send firefighters to help Washington, Oregon, and the other western states because their fire season started earlier. Then theirs ended, and they would send folks to help us. They're also in this new calendar. Um, so it, it's, it's a cycle that doesn't end. So it's, 
it's one of those things where you can throw money at it, and it does help somewhat, but it is a resource problem. It's a policy problem. It's, it's a where people are living problem. It's so complicated, and um, it really speaks to how California is, is uh, organized at the moment. And is it a problem with re- any kind of solution, even if the legislature wanted to be more aggressive, even if it went beyond just studying these things? It seems that, that the resources simply aren't available to do all that needs to be done. Well, I think that uh, the way to attack it, uh, because there are many, many aspects to it, is to, to think less about we need more firefighters and think more about how can we either prevent, f- forestall these fires or see that they're smaller or mainly not have to fight them because we don't have to defend homes and people uh, in, in a reverse order. They're more interested in saving people than homes. So what I mean by that is someone is going to have to make a very difficult decision, and I don't see any public officials doing it, and they don't do it anywhere that I know of in the West, which says, I'm sorry, you may not live there. You are in a dangerous place. You cannot expect your your neighbors, other Californians, taxpayers, these agencies to come in and, and, and help you, just like some people aren't allowed to build in a floodplain or when you are living on a, a major earthquake fault, you understand certain things. Um, your ability to insure your house is, is uh, you know, limited, etc. So one way to, to deal with it is to have fewer fires that have to be put out. You have to put out a fire in uh, a subdivision, but in Alaska, there's fires that, fires that burn for months at a time. That there's, they monitor them, but there's no attempt to put them out because they're actually doing work for you by removing vegetation, but they're not, they're not um, threatening anything. So the way we build in California, where we build, our population, all of that is impacting the, the, the necessity to put out these fires and, and to respond to them. And that's the problem. So how do you resolve that? <laughs> some, some adult has to stand up and say, we can't build in these places anymore. And, and that I, I don't see any elected official telling any homeowner or private property owner that they can't do that. But the next thing that happens, and it happens in places like Australia, they say, if you build there, we're not saying you can't. We're just letting you know. You're, you're grown-ups. You're going to build there. These are the things that could happen. We will not be coming down your driveway with a fire truck. And then, I mean, it sounds horrible and, and cruel, but then they're educated. There's training programs. Homeowners are certified um, and get training, and they stay and defend their homes and um, with mixed results. But he, he, you, we can't save everyone, which is the horrible triage of, of firefighting. It's just that's the problem. There will always never be enough resources because there are so many people in dense, dense populations of people who are in places that are highly flammable. Given that elected officials won't say that, have the insurance companies been willing to step up and perhaps say that to potential clients? You know, if you wanted to do a threat map in California, it would be like red. So we have sea level rise on the coast. You have earthquakes across most of the state uh, that are difficult and costly to insure. You you have fire maps, and you have the western part of of the, you know, Mojave Desert where it's becoming so impossible to live, it's unsustainable. So, um, yeah, I think the market always tells us more than and and more quickly um, and more uh, acutely what the problems are and they're gonna they're gonna walk away and we may they may end up doing what what's happened with earthquakes is uh, the state will set up some kind of a its own fund um, but again that's taxpayers and mm-hmm. you know I'm not a libertarian but I can see that people would complain about this right. um, you know liability. We've all heard the comments that have come from the White House over the course of the past few weeks. Has that had any impact at all as you've seen it in terms of the Department of Forestry, the federal government, the Department of Interior in dealing with any of this? Has it made any real difference on the ground? Uh, no. If you're talking about President Trump's tweet that, that these, these fires are a, a function of mismanagement of the forest, uh, 
for the most part, they're not occurring in forests to start with, certainly not in Southern California and, and only minimally uh, for, the, for the campfire. Um, so the, the professionals who work in the U.S. Forest Service uh, and, and all the other services, federal agencies that have firefighting uh, arms, they know what the issues are. I mean, that is just, um, uh, you know, I, I, <laughs> it's kind of a typical tweet from him. And it, it's especially delicious, I'm sure, for President Trump because he likes to take on California. Um, but it, it, that kind of comment will have zero impact. This week, the Secretary of Interior was touring uh, burn sites in the state, and he will understand that uh, – this requires a federal response equally. I mean, it, it, the, the implication from the president was that these mismanagement of the forests in California is a responsibility of state officials. Uh, they have a role to play. But basically, these are federal forests. These are U.S. forests that are managed by the U.S. government. So if you want to put blame somewhere, you can put it at the feet of the federal government. And blame is not a useful thing to do at the moment. But... Um, uh, these the, the forested area in California is, for the most part, run by the federal government. Is there anything new that we can learn from these fires, either in northern or southern California, that's any different than what we learned a year ago? I don't think there was anything that was particularly unique. In, in southern California, they were wind-driven fires that we anticipate when the Santa Ana winds are blowing. In northern California, you can't, I mean, these were human-caused fires. They have, the cause has not been determined, but unless there was a thunderstorm nobody knew about, these are human-caused fires. So um, whether it was a, a utility or a car spark, it, any, it, you, you, you know, you give a dirty look to a tree, it's going to catch fire with aridity that we have here and the, the, the drought that we have. So there's nothing more to learn. It's what you do with what you already know. There's, there are going to be discussions about how do you evacuate, what do we do about getting people out of their homes because even in mandatory evacuations, 10% of the people stay. I mean, it's there. We have to have, I think, more education. And public officials don't like to do it because it's scary. They have PSAs that are, you know, have animated figures or people saying, hey, if there's a fire, no, this is serious business. And uh, peop, I, in my opinion, I, I think we don't do enough to educate homeowners or anybody else about the science of fire, how fires move, what you can expect to happen, and, uh, you know, the enormity of it. And, again, I'm referring to Australia because I, I wrote about it and spent some time examining what they do. Um, they lay it out for people, and it's based on science. So you cannot outrun a fire. You cannot expect to get in your car, floor it, and then, you know, outrun a fire because what happens is you drive down uh, a road that you've – lived on for 40 years in that smoke and in the panic people crash they drive off the road um they get out of their 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 tires start melting which is true and they get out and they try to run and they find unfortunately you know families 10 feet from their car so there has to be probably what might come out of this is a discussion about when and how people should evacuate um the implications of staying at home to defend your house, and if you do that, how might you do that safely? Julie Cart, her article on forest management appears online at Cal Matters. Julie, I thank you so much for spending time with us here on Radio Who, What, Why. My pleasure, Jeff. Thank you. And thank you for listening and for joining us here on Radio Who, What, Why. I hope you join us next week for another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. I'm Jeff Sheckman. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share and help others find it by rating and reviewing it on iTunes. You can also support this podcast and all the work we do by going to whowhatwhy.org forward slash donate.